All right. Looks like everyone is logged in. Welcome all. So glad to have you to another Pragmatic Institute product chat. It is so good to see you all there. A uh, reminder at the top, if you are comfortable with it and able to turn on your cameras, uh, we're all craving human interaction these days and love to see your faces. And of course, it makes it more pleasant for our presenter as well. So if you're comfortable with that, we'd love to see your smiling faces. Um, if you have questions during the presentation today, go ahead and stick them over in the chat. You can send them either to the entire group if you like, or you can send them just to me, Eddie Gordon, the host, and I will keep an eye on those and toss them over to our presenter today as they come in. And then um, just a couple housekeeping items at the top here. We have to give a shout out to the brand new Pragmatic Institute alumni community, the PAC, P-A-C, as we like to call it. Um, go check it out if you haven't yet. This is the new online community for pragmatic alumni. This is the place where members will be able to receive, uh, there's a curated library, there are member exclusive events available for you in there, different than just the normal alumni community that you may have, the alumni resource center that you may already be a part of. If you missed the open house, the free open house for the Pragmatic Alumni community, which was a few days ago, you can still see what goes on in there by visiting us at pragmaticinstitute.com slash community. There's a bunch of videos and content there. So you can get an idea of what that is all about and be sure to take advantage of the special introductory rate, 30% off list price if you're quick about it. So check that out. I have to mention, of course, that today's discussion is brought to you in partnership with Product Development Days as part of their executive series of webinars. This will all culminate in their grand event, which happens on the 27th through 29th of October. You can find out more about that at productdevelopmentdays.com. All right, enough chat. Today's guest is a coach of product management teams, agile development organizations. Uh, he's been the go-to product guy at six startups, holding roles there such as CEO, VP of product management. He's acted as product consultant to over 100 tech companies. And somehow during all that time, he found more time to write the long-running Product Bytes newsletter, which was then collected into the book, The Art of Product Management. He currently runs Miranov Consulting. Please welcome Rich Miranov. Rich, it, and I didn't even get to uh, your thesis on dinosaur extinction theories. Hopefully, during the presentation, you can at least work some of that in there for us as well. What do you think? Thanks so much, Eddie. I think I'll park that for another time because okay. we've right. got about you know a half hour of of content plus some Q and A at the end, and and I've of course overburdened the agenda a little bit. So so let's jump right in. And and for anybody who's got me live on camera, you can see that's not my face on the slide, but it, it's another product leader. So just trying to vary the look a little bit here. So here's our agenda for the next uh, forty five minutes. Uh, really four points uh, I want to touch on. Uh, the first is, you know, what's product management's mission in a slide? You know, why do we bother? Why do we exist? And it's not just the transactional sense of somebody has to write a JIRA ticket. Um, second thing is, how do I think about well-structured teams? My observation is, no matter how good a product manager you are, if you're not working with a stable, thoughtfully designed development and design and maker team, you really can't get much done. So, you know, how do we think about teams when we're putting our product leaders hat on, when we're thinking about thriving product organizations, we're going to have to reach across the aisle to all of our key groups, again, designers and developers and DevOps and such, and think about well-structured teams. Third thing is a little bit about, you know, if you were going to build yourself a new product organization, how might you think about picking those folks, training them, mentoring them, uh, I'm told that nobody's born wanting to grow up and be a product manager, right? The Willie Nelson song wasn't, parents don't let your kids grow up to product manage. Um, so how do we turn folks who've got some other skills into product managers? 
And then the last one, since it seems you know of the moment, just a, a couple of thoughts on how we might think about the problem of changing roadmaps, changing plans, rearranging all of our assumptions in a crisis, and, and how to be balanced about that rather than very reactive. So there's our four topics. I'm going to flip through them in that order. And again, if you've got an interesting question or, or an interrupt, drop it into the uh, chat log, and Eddie's going to interrupt me as I go with things uh, that come up. Um, last bit before we dig in, uh, I've sometimes done a thing that we call the smoke jumper head of product job. And what that means is uh, I uh, almost a dozen times now I've dropped into companies where they forgot to have someone running the product team, or maybe they forgot to have a product team in its entirety. And it's my job in a couple of quarters to straighten it all out, figure it out, hire and fire and reposition and reprice and re build bridges, and then help hire behind me the full-time person who's going to run the product team. So lately, last half decade or so, maybe the full decade, I've been taking the leader approach. How do we think about the product organization as a whole, as much as the individual product manager approach of how do I get my job done? Okay, so let's dig in. All right, so here's our little North Star because everybody needs a graphic. There you are. Um, and I have just a, a short list of things that I think are the essentials that if you're doing tech product management, you really should start with. And for me, it's always about focusing first on why our customers pay us money and how our products give them value and make their lives better rather than the revenue metric. Revenue is a trailing number. If we do a good job, people pay us money, but we have to bring more than just greed to the office. We have to bring you know, love and attention and a real focus every single hour on why our customers care and how the thing we're doing adds value, right? Second thing for me is we as product folks have to get ahead of the build cycle. Um, I love Melissa Perry's book about the build trap. That's all about how if we're the lagging indicator, if all the decisions have been made about what to build and who it's for, and we're just writing JIRA tickets, then we're really not doing the product management job. Um, it's bigger than that, it's earlier than that, and it's strategic. How do we get out ahead before we've decided to fund a new project or product and figure out if it's a good idea, who it's for, how we're going to make money, launches, audiences, all the things we've got to do before we decide to stack up the millions of dollars a year in putting developers against stuff. So do we have a product strategy? I hope so. Should we build this thing? Well, always a fair question, right? Can we build it as a good idea? And will a lot of customers pay for it? Because if they don't, we're really in a professional services model where we better make our money up front on the very first customer. Um, third thing, uh, I think probably everybody on this uh, webinar knows it, but I've never met an engineering team that had capacity, that had slack, that had white space, that had room in next week's sprint. Um, every team I've run into is five times or 10 times or 35 times overbooked. Uh, the proof on this, of course, is if you go to the executive team and mention that you've got just one extra day in next week's sprint, uh, the executive team will give you seven years worth of things that they would like us to do next week, right? It's inevitable. It's, it's always true that we're short of what we'd like to have. So that puts us as product folks in the ruthless prioritization category of having to make really, really hard choices between lots of things that are reasonable and justified and would make sense. It's not enough to say, is this a good idea? We have to ask, is it a better idea than the other 11 things that came in in the last half hour, right? Little bits of, of uh, business cases, hard trade-offs. You know, we have to be the people who stand up and say, you know, it's a, it's a five pound development team and we have 10 pounds worth of requests. Um, fourth thing, I believe as product folks, and, and remember, we have all the responsibility and none of the authority. Nobody works for us. And so we have to spend a lot of our days every single day building bridges to developers, designers, DevOps, marketing, sales, operations, finance. We have to, we have to be thoughtful. We have to anticipate their needs. We have to get out ahead of them. We don't always do what they want, but let's bring a lot of empathy and appreciation to all the folks who do the thing that we don't do and probably don't want to do. 
right? And then last, and, and this has come up on a couple of my coaching calls in the last week, which is why I put it back on the slide. Um, I believe that when a product manager stands up in front of a customer or a prospect, it's our obligation to actually tell the truth. So whereas our sales team may have gone way out ahead of their headlights or marketing over their skis about features that we might or might not have in 2027 and might work in 2029, I think as product managers with long-term relationships with our customers and their best interests at heart, we shouldn't lie to them, right? Either we have the feature or we don't, or it's in beta or it's in design, but let's be clear about the language we use. Right. So again, just a way to anchor um, myself and a lot of you in what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to build things that our customers are going to love and pay us money for and deliver real value. And I think when we do that and we coordinate with the rest of the folks in our company, then we get good results. When we get way out ahead and promise things we don't have or forget that our customers pay us money, I think we, we lose our way. Good. I'm done with mission. So, uh, Eddie, unless you have an interrupt, I'm going to keep going. Carry on, Rich. Okay. All right. So here's our little agenda slide. So we know where we are. Let's talk a little bit about well-structured teams. And I'm going to borrow a lot of this right out of some of the early agile work and even before then, because um, since I've been in the business since the eighties and agile really didn't become popular until the nineties and then get advertised until the two thousands, you know, they're borrowing from a lot of old stuff too, right? So the first thing for me, the very first principle is if we build the wrong thing, it's 100% waste. Even if it's beautifully designed, even if it's delivered on time, if it's scalable and secure and failover and multi-tenant and all these cool things, if it doesn't solve a real customer need, if people don't pay us for it, if they don't use it, it's 100% waste. And we as product folks are not allowed to blame our engineering team for building something that the world doesn't want, right? By the way, there's only one thing worse, at least in the enterprise space, to building a product that no one buys. And the one thing worse is to build a product that exactly one enterprise buys, and now you have to support it for the next five years, right? So really important, everything about validation, everything about early discovery, everything about understanding our customers before we try to sell them something. So many places we lead with the sales cycle, we take an order and then we bring something back that makes no sense, right? So um, as I look at the way we structure teams, this is gonna be my very first important thing. How do we find out what's really true in the world instead of just getting it through a lot of other folks? Um, the biggest frustration I hear both from product and development design folks is it's hard to finish anything at most companies, right? Every 2.45 hours, somebody from the executive team comes down with a new idea, or they just got off a call with a customer, or there's some issue. It's nearly impossible to finish anything if we don't stick with it for a little while. So the strategy du jour, where every new customer seems to change our strategy, is one where we're going to get very little work done. Right? So again, trying to figure out how we're going to design teams to sidestep that issue. Uh, and the third thing I'm going to look for here, because we're going to put org charts up in just a sec, is I believe every handoff between the actual end users who really use our stuff, whether that's typing on a keyboard or poking on a mobile app or whatever it is, and the development team itself headed up by product or, or adjacent to product, every time we have a handoff, every time we take somebody else's notes, Every time we think that looking in Salesforce is going to give us an answer or a lighthearted five question survey or NPS scores, every time we disconnect or put more distance between the team that actually builds stuff and the people who actually use it, I think we get poorer answers and we end up just writing down what somebody along the way said, right? And then the last thing for me, because it appears in almost every uh, scrum book I've ever picked up. I don't believe in the word proxies. I want to re remove proxies on, delete proxies. Everybody in the chain who thinks they know what we should build but doesn't really talk to customers and doesn't really talk to developers is somebody I want to take opinion from but not take direction from. So again, we'll paint that out in the next couple of slides. So let's, let's dig in, 
right? The last part of the principle here for me, and here's somebody drawing on a whiteboard, and I don't actually know if she's a product manager, a developer, a designer, a support person, you know, whoever. What I know is that when I bring problems to my team and we thrash over and we work through and we try to solve the problem in interesting ways, we get better solutions than when I, as a product manager, write down the answer, put it in a ticket and ship it over to my team, right? I believe the good product managers don't and I put it in quotes, gather requirements as if they're fruit on the tree and we go out in the orchard and we pluck requirements off the trees. Uh, I observe that almost all customers misstate their problems. They offer us solutions instead of problems. They don't know our architectures. They forget that adding 57 new features to a product makes it harder to use. Um, I think we have to unpack stuff. We have to figure out what customers really want instead of what customers say they want. And most importantly, instead of what sales reps tell us customers say they want, right? So I'm going to talk all about for the next few minutes, how do we get our development teams directly in contact with real end users, not proxies, not notes, not in between. How do we figure out what's broken, really understand the problem before we start to create solutions? And then everybody gets on the whiteboard, right? Um, I observe, and, and I've been told by many of my development teams that, all developers are smarter than all product managers. You guys may not know this, but there's proof. All you have to do is ask your developers and they will admit that they believe that they're way smarter than you are. So the idea that you're gonna bring them a fully baked solution and tell them just how to do their job is wasting all of their enthusiasm and wasting all of their smarts and their good input and their goodwill. So how do we get our team together to figure out what the solutions look like? Right? And that's going to take time and energy and smarts and a lot of retrospectives, but it's way better than transcribing what some random person told me onto a post-it note and then typing it into JIRA. Okay, I'm hoping I said something controversial, but um, Eddie, anything? We're going to keep going then. Yeah, just, just one question that came through in regards to shifting priorities. The question yep. was, how often is too often for shifting project priorities? Is there no room for strategic changes in direction or course corrections? Well, and, and of course there are, but that's a how much question, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it depends a lot on size. So for instance, I, I expect every team to fix some bugs in every sprint, right? And we know we're going to do that and we allocate 10 or 15% of our bandwidth every sprint to fix some bugs and changing our mind about which bug we fix is not a big deal usually if you know we take similar size stuff particularly if there's some new problem or supports reporting a lot of a lot of issues on the other hand changing our corporate strategy or our product strategy probably is a big swing of the wheel turn 90 degrees one way or the other and if we do that more than once every quarter or two what we find is we're getting nothing finished so I think the bigger the change, the bigger the, you know, the impetus here, the more careful and the slower we should be about it and the less frequently, right? I also believe that the team itself is going to make a lot of these choices with product management guidance and leadership. Um, it's when stuff comes to the outside that we want to be a little extra suspicious because so many of the requests we get are either not sensible or not well thought out or not as urgent as the person who brings it to us wants it to be. So I always look for ways to do a little bit of slowing down on this so we have time to think rather than thrash. Um, uh, there's good evidence that the more things you work on, the higher your working process, the less you finish in aggregate. So every time somebody tells you the lie that this is gonna be really small and it's probably only just 10 lines of code and there's room in the sprint and can't we just get it done, right, is all about uh, not noticing the pattern that the more we throw on the team without taking something off, the less they get done in total, right? So think strategically. All right, let's draw some pictures because, you know, some people like pictures better than words. So um, I'm going to draw my favorite empowered direct learning product organization here. I'm going to paint it. It takes a few steps. The first part of this, if you start on the left, so here's a stable, complete development or maker or engineering team. So by stable and complete, we mean we're not borrowing folks from elsewhere. We're not putting all the front end engineers on one team. 
and the back end engineers on another team and the data scientists on a third team so that we can't get anything done without pulling three teams in, right? We want developers, designers, maybe there's an architect, maybe there's a DevOps person, maybe there's a tech writer. Um, I prefer um, uh, test engineers who do test, in, test automation rather than manual testers because that saves you a lot of money and builds better product. But how do we have a team that's gonna stay on our piece of the product for a long time, for years? And we wanna carve that team up so it owns a piece of the customer value, not just random tickets. So this might be the team if you're in e-commerce that owns putting things into and taking things out of your shopping cart. You know, If you're in uh, the ERP world, it might be the team that owns getting new products in and validated and how we put them on our price list, right? Whatever. They own a piece of value. The product manager sits with that team. Of course, right now, you know, in the virtual world, I don't know where sitting with means, but we have a product manager assigned to every team and that product manager owns the same value stream. And what that means is that we now have the right to go all the way to the other side and talk to the actual end users not just the buyers, not just the sales people, not just the channel folks, not just our support organization, but we actually get the real folks who use our piece of the product on the Zoom, on the phone, on the Hangout, whatever it is, and we interrogate them within an inch of their lives about what's working, what's not working, and how we might improve it and what problems we've got. And we do that often, frequently, and we do it outside the sales cycle. Every product manager should be in on sales calls, but sales calls are not learning calls because we do completely different things. We ask different questions. And if you've ever asked a bunch of open-ended questions of a prospect about how they might like to improve the product in the future, your sales team will never invite you to another sales call, right? So know whether you're on a sales call or a learning call. And I always insist that the product managers of my team set up at least a call every single week, maybe two or three if we can get them with real live customers so we can start to see the patterns. We can start to integrate across dozens or hundreds of customers instead of just hearing one, right? So this would work, by the way, if you had a 11 person startup, you just need this one team, right? But most of us work at bigger companies. So let's scale up. I'm gonna suggest that we wanna slice these teams in horizontal value slices, not by market, right? Not by revenue, but by pieces of the product suite or technology that add value. So somebody owns search and find and sort, and somebody owns logins and accounts and billing, and some team owns, you know, security and infrastructure and scalability, whatever they own. But we want to have teams that own whole pieces of the product because we want them to be not just doing writing code or getting stuff built. We want a strong, emotional, direct connection between the folks who use that piece of the product and the folks who build it. When we, when we get our teams in on these calls, and again, I'm gonna say, you know, if I'm scheduling two calls a week with customers, I can't have my whole team on every call, but I'm gonna invite one member of the development or design team or two to sit in on each call, remind them that they may be getting some sampling bias. And in fact, they get to ask questions by writing out something on a post-it note and passing it to me so I can run the call. But designers hear different things and developers hear different things and architects hear different things than product managers. So rather than deciding I'm the smartest kid in the room, I really wanna have them sampling the real live words from real live customers and users. And gosh, that's so motivating. It's so important. Um, it makes them come to work every day. We don't come to work every day just because we get paid. We come to work every day because we recognize the problems of our customers and we care about them and we want to solve it for them. So how do we energize our team by including them in these conversations, by sharing the notes, by recording them, by finding the bits, right? Really important. Not just me listening, writing it down and telling them how to do their jobs. Okay, so, and usually in a big company, there's some management. So here's somebody who's running the product team and somebody who's running the design team, somebody who's running the engineering team. And these tend to be sort of functional because you know, I, as the head of product, might wanna grow a lot of skills or talent in my product management team, but I don't wanna do their jobs for them. Okay, I'm gonna go on to a couple of lesser, less favored charts, unless Eddie tells me we have a question. 
We do. We've got a couple coming in now Good. that are around the definition of value. Ah. Let me just read these two related sure. ones here to you. Tara asks, I'm curious as to how to define value streams and the interaction between the PO and product managers. Right. And then Edita asks, it seems there is a difference in value versus functional. Yep. How should the product managers orient around value versus a component of functional experience? Right. And and there's no perfect answers to these. And this has yeah. a tremendous amount to do with your product and how it's architected. Um, first, well, let's tackle value. So for instance, if you were putting up a um, a dating site and you were going to get people to meet each other and go out on dates, the value they're looking for is to meet similar I presume similar kinds of people and and have a good experience. The value is not the seventeen dollars a month that you charge them for that. That's your value. If you are doing um, machine learning around optimizing how supply chains work in order to reduce the wasted um, raw materials that's in your supply your customer supply chain, they're going to measure you. They're going to consider value by measuring whether you're saving the materials in their supply chain. Right. So if you take the headline off your website. The reason someone buys your product, that's their value. The fact that we extract money from that is great for us, but paying us money is not what they would consider as customers our value. That's along the way, right? Now, as far as functional versus you know value streams, tremendous differentiation across product groups. I'm always looking for some portion of the product which has its own audience. So for instance, every enterprise product has a bunch of admin functions around adding users and permissions and password definitions and backups and logins and security and scalability, right? So there's a group of folks who are going to use my enterprise application and they're going to have that cluster of feature function capability. I'd, I'd look for ways to put a, a rope around that and say, you know, who's, who's the sub persona for that? And is there a set of tasks or goals or activities that go together both technically and on the customer side? So we can have a technical ownership of, of part of the product, but we also know who it's for. And so I wouldn't, for instance, have a database restructuring team unless I was in the database restructuring business, right? But th there's a lot of ways to chop that. And I don't think there's a perfect, you know, universal platonic answer. All right, I'm going to keep going just so we don't run short on time. All right, let's draw something that I think is less good. And, and I'm going to lean on some terminology here. And actually, let me back up and apologize. I actually don't care whether somebody calls themselves a product owner or a product manager or something else. What I do care about is that if you open up the old scrum books and you do only what it says the product owner is supposed to do, which is mostly how IT organizations think of product instead of how product companies think of product. Um, the narrow scrum definition of a product owner is somebody who sits in their chair 24 by seven, never leaves the building, never talks to the customer. And their job is to write stories, get stories accepted and to, and to you know, work on, on the technical side of story writing and sprint planning. I think that's an important part of the job, but I observe that if you're not talking directly to end users, as we will identify in a moment, then I'm going to tell you a lot of your stories aren't very good or are wrong and you don't know because you're channeling second or third or fourth or fifth hand uh, information from other folks. So whatever we call ourselves, and I don't really care, what I'm going to walk us through here is that when we draw this organization, where on the left are the people who make or build stuff, and on the right are the people who demand things but don't really understand or care how things are built, um, we have this instead of we have a, an exchange of problems, what we have is an exchange of requirements. And we have requirements coming from folks who mostly don't write requirements, mostly don't get them right, mostly don't interrogate customers as to what the real problem is. We tend to get folks who write down just what the customer said. And as I've been noting over and over again, most customers get it wrong. They don't start by explaining their problem. They start by explaining the solution they would imagine for our problem. And they mostly don't understand our architectures, uh, the clutter in our applications, how stuff gets done. So when I see requirements flowing instead of problem statements, I worry that probably half of what we're doing is wasted. 
And I also note that the folks on the left, whether I call them product managers, product owners, or somebody else, they have very little organizational power or political power to push back. They tend to be measured on, did we give the folks on the right what the folks on the right asked for instead of, did we deliver value to real customers? Did we solve real problems? Are people using it? Right? So I worry when we have the split between folks on the right who demand things but don't really care how they're built or what the priorities are or how hard it is or if it's complete, and folks on the left who don't have the organizational backing, the, the power structure to say, no, we're not doing that, that we're going to get a lot of waste and a lot of frustration. So I'm still keeping our stable teams because, of course, I want to have that. But the idea that we're going to split an inward-facing product owner who doesn't get out with customers and an outward facing product manager who doesn't rub elbows with the development design maker team, I think it leads to bad results. I think it leads to waste and frustration and lack of clarity. So, you know, if you're a product owner, that's great. If you're a product owner who talks directly with real end users once or twice a week, you're my hero. If you're a product owner who's put in a box and are not allowed to do that, I think it's hard to do your job or it's hard to succeed at your job. So again, sticking less on titles and more on results or outcomes, this isn't a model I, I like. And generally I find two or three or four other hops on the right side between the folks who say they're looking after a market or segment and the people who actually talk with customers. So maybe it's more than two hops, maybe it's six. All right, let's keep going because there's one that um, I, I dislike way more and some of you have seen it. Right. Um, whenever I see an organization that starts with these two things at the top, notice I've said IT instead of engineering, which means it's probably not a company that builds software for a living. It's a company that does something else. It's a bank, it's an airline, it's a government agency, right? And they have this weird distinction between the business and IT as if you could be in the banking business and not deeply be involved in all of your systems and software and back office, right? And, and therefore we escalate or we elevate the business to be the folks who make all the choices and have all the funding. And then we tell IT that they're in charge of doing whatever the business tells them to on time, on budget. And we start grading them, not on value, not on usage, not on adoption, not on outcomes, not on up and to the right, but we grade them on delivering what the business said it wanted on the day they said it wanted it. And we almost never measure outcomes. So I'm going to fill the rest of the box in, but notice this is an executive level challenge. If you're a PO or a PM way down in the box to the left, pretty hard for you to change. But I observe over and over and over again that when we put this structure in place, we're going to have a lot of waste and a lot of frustration. On the right side, it's going to look a lot more political because everybody wants stuff. And if you remember, Every team is 10x oversubscribed, so most people don't get most of the things they want. But on the right side, you've got all these folks from all kinds of groups lobbying each other, trying to figure out who is the business executive with the most clout who can force IT to do the thing I want them to do. And all the business cases, if we have them, are inflated so that I can get the thing I want because I did a bigger business case than everybody else, right? So on the right side, there's a lot of chaos and frustration because there's not good traffic control and there's nobody making strategic choices that make sense on the left side. And on the left side, of course, we usually a CIO, not a VP engineering, not a CTO, not a VP of products, right? We tend to have project pools instead of long lived teams, which means when we finish a project, we blow up that team and suddenly nobody's in charge of maintaining it and nobody remembers how it was done, right? Um, and then a various list of people who are supposed to corral those teams, product owner, technical product manager, BA, your choice. Again, not getting stuck on titles, but notice that none of the folks down in, in that box um, really have much decision-making authority. It becomes much more um, pushing the system to deliver on time what came across the, the, the transom and what got transmitted, by the way, were these two things. One was a set of technical requirements, mostly from folks who aren't technical enough to get them right, and delivery dates when we need them without any regard to whether that makes any sense and we're going to push something else out, right? So this is almost guaranteed to overload the entire system and to cause frustration on both sides because we're demanding 10 times or five times as many things 
as we can possibly finish, and many of them don't make sense or conflict. So when I draw this chart, it's mostly to take to task the folks at the top and see if we can reform ourselves into a more producty structure. All right, I'm guessing that's pretty controversial in a lot of ways. So let's take a breath and ask Eddie whether anybody had some um, angst on this one. In a no, no angst, but definitely some questions that we can tackle. This one that just came through from Hema asked, do you still suggest keeping two different departments, business and IT? Well, to the extent that your business is becoming a software business and you know, Mark Andreessen 20 years ago reminded us that software is eating the world, but increasingly businesses are really becoming, you know, more and more and more software businesses. And as that happens, as the technology becomes critical to getting things done, I think this is a structure that fails on its face. So any of us who've ever tried to deposit a check to our bank with their mobile app and failed entirely, anybody who's tried to reserve an airline seat on a you know, on an airline website that didn't seem to have the right steps and made me buy the ticket before I saw if there were any seats open, knows that it's not just about banking and airlines anymore. And so when I see this, I'm always looking to break off some task groups, let's say, right? I want some horizontal slices here where we get the people who really interact with the world and the people who really build stuff together instead of 15 hops away. Now, maybe it can't be the whole thing. There's a lot of operations in other parts of the company, but if we're building software that real end users are gonna to have to use or real employees are gonna to have to use, I don't see this model delivering us good results. So I try to break it up and, and blow it up and create smaller teams that cut horizontally and are closer to their users. Not always uh, possible. Keith just chimed in, it uh, doesn't make a difference. What if you have business, engineering and IT, any difference there? Well, so, so when I hear that, I'm guessing that the IT folks are probably in charge of things like employee laptops and building security and other stuff. That makes sense to me. Um, I want the engineering team to own, and, and I call it engineering specifically because engineering is a profit center. If we build better products, we make more money. IT is a cost center and everybody's trying to spend less on IT. So we might, you know, we might even outsource a lot of the IT stuff like configuring laptops and handling password resets and building security and, you know, whether folks got through all their training stuff. But product is what we sell to customers to make money. And we better treat it as serious business. We better hire the best folks. Um, everybody who tells me they want to have a cheaper engineering team and they want to outsource to save money, I think they're missing the point because better products make us more money and cheaper engineers and designers don't get us better products. So uh, again, this whole model is one that feels like the 1950s to me or the 1960s. And I think it doesn't serve companies well if the thing we're doing on the right is really business critical. You know, let's not have this distinction. Yeah. We've got lots of questions coming okay, through. We'll just keep if rolling. You, if you want to roll on and then we can get to lots of good. Perfect. Too. Okay, good. So third bit, um, hiring talent and product mentoring. Um, nobody's born being a product manager, product um, owner, product marketer. This is really hard. It's really hard. And you don't get it by reading one book and you don't get it by being in one day of class and you don't get it by following somebody around for a week. Right. So how do we think about structuring teams? How do we have thriving, interesting, successful product teams when it's hard to become one? It's hard to grow and learn. Right. So first of all, I would note products of craft. It's not a procedure just because you've got the grammar down on how to write a user story. And here's our user story. As a user, I want to do stuff, right? It's a, it's a qualified grammatical thing and it's worthless and useless, right? If we think our job is to write tickets, well, you're not working in my department, right? So things. Um, there's lots and lots of resources out there for what I would call transactional activities. How do you do the things you do a lot during the day? Sizing and lightweight business cases and sprint planning and release notes and right. Um, you can go find a lot of material on how to do the activities, which we're not going to confuse with being a product person, but are necessary, right? They're along the way. Again, back to waste. I observed that you could write all the stories on time that are grammatically correct, 
but if they don't lead to products that customers love and, and use and want to pay for, they're waste. Right. Okay. So the next thing down is that I think there's a whole set of skills that are hard to grow. They take practice, they take mentoring, they take all kinds of inputs, right? None of us knows how to interview a customer the first time. So we're going to have to have somebody look over our shoulder the first six times or sit in on five of these, get a bunch of critiques, right? Business cases are hard because they're not generic. Uh, framing problems are hard because we have to really exercise our brains and think hard and not get stuck in our own assumptions, right? Setting objectives is hard. It's really hard because if you set the wrong objectives, we all do the wrong stuff. A, a great example here, many of you have been at this company. Um, a lot of companies decide that they wanna save money on customer support by shortening the average call time to their support desk, right? And they put a bonus in place for their support team to give them extra money if they get folks on the, off the phone faster. And you know what happens? They get folks off the phone faster. You know what else happens after they get their bonuses? Most of their customers are unhappy because they didn't solve their problems and they have to make three calls, each of which are within the limit, right? So setting objectives is hard. If you're a product leader or a senior person, you're gonna have to walk your newbies through this a lot, right? Uh, negotiating with stakeholders is really hard. It's really hard. And the idea that you're going to face down some enterprise sales rep who claims to have a million dollar deal, if you just do this one little tiny enhancement, which they think is only 10 lines of code and we can get it done in an hour, right? You need experience here. You need backing. You need some political clout. Um, negotiating with stakeholders is hard. So we're not going to just learn that out of a book, right? And then um, I think you have to have strategy. Right? So I see so many product teams where they're working on stuff, but it doesn't add up to anything because they don't have an overall goal or plan or strategy. And strategy is hard. Everybody in your company says they have a strategy or six, right? But if we don't have a strategy and we don't have a set of broader skills, doing the transactions are not going to help, right? And that's leading me to, I think, um, here's, here's my point. Every single person that I would hire into a new product department, into a product department who's new to the job is going to need a lot of coaching and mentoring and training and support and skills building and whatever else you're going to call it. Don't hire somebody out of some subject expertise pool who knows your product but has never been a product person. Throw them in the water and see if they can swim. That's a good way to waste everybody's time and energy and love. So if you're leading a product team, you're going to have to plan on, you're going to have to budget for lots of time getting folks up to speed and learning how to be product managers. Um, it's, I find it especially challenging with subject experts who believe they know more than all of their users because deep in their hearts, they don't want to talk to users. They don't want to ask questions. That they believe they already know the answers. And that's the road to ruin because you're going to end up building a product that's only useful for subject experts, right? So be cautious, and, and this, of course, is going to play into the hiring question, right? Um, and then uh, some of you may know this. Um, here's the pragmatic framework, and the reason I put this up here is because um, often we get stuck in one box or another, and it's not necessarily true in every company that the product manager is going to do all of these, but somebody better be doing the, each of these. And it's not enough just to say, well, here's your business plan template, go write business plans. Um, if you're leading a product team, if you're, if you're bringing folks up to speed on how to do this, you may have 23 different areas of coaching and help. Some of them they're going to get right away and some of them are hard. So don't assume that throwing a, a book to somebody is going to turn them into a product manager, right? Send them off to class, work with them, review their work, have some peers to coach them. Think hard about the mix of your team. And that's really important as we get to sort of close out this thought. I believe as a product leader, I need an organizational plan. It's not enough just to grab a bunch of folks, give them the little name tag that says, I'm a product manager. Hello, you know, my name's George, I'm a product manager. No, not going to work. So questions like how many product managers do we need? Or product owners, if we're calling them that, right? And I'm going to lean towards some story that says, you know, count all the makers in your organization, developers, designers, DevOps, tech writers, test automation engineers, and you probably need a product manager for each of, let's say, group of eight or group of nine of those, 
might line up with teams. If you've got six product managers and 400 developers, I know they're all failing, right? So as a product leader, I, I should have a theory about how many folks I need, right? I should have a, a hiring and interviewing strategy. Do I want a mix of senior veterans and newbies who bring enthusiasm but need help and a couple of subject experts, right? What's my plan for how to assemble a team, a group, a department, so we actually have the required skills and can help each other, right? Not enough to just let HR write a job description and send you folks because they don't understand what product is either, right? Um, third one, right, have a coaching plan, have a mentoring plan. The folks who are new to product on your team are going to need a lot of help give them the help, right? And again, I think of that as maybe an hour or two every single week for the first six to 12 months, right? It's not, here's a blog post from Rich, read it. I mean, I'm happy if folks do that, but still, right? So, you know, that's really important because when we're thinking about building a team that's enthusiastic, you know, that's thriving, that does good work, we, we need to fill that team out. Okay, let's keep going. And then the last one, uh, be before we get to questions here, let's think about crises, right? Um, we're in the middle of one. It's easy, and, and I think Eddie asked a question before about this. It's easy to throw your plan up in the air and decide that you got to do everything different. But that's knee-jerk. That's reactive. That's not very strategic. So let's talk just a little bit about how to unpack a crisis, right? And, and here's, here's my order of operations for this. Um, if you're at a company that's in crisis, um, you know, particularly if it's, you're in one of those very difficult industries that COVID's brought to its knees, there's, there's the virus. If you're in travel and transportation, if you're in you know, rentals or public events or selling tickets to major things, um, you know, if you're in brick and mortar retail, you gotta figure out if your industry is gonna be around. Right? There's some things that you must do at your company level so that your business lives through the crisis. Ugly as it is, I know that Eventbrite let maybe half of their staff go because they're in the business of selling tickets to live events and that's not going so well, right? The Zoom folks on the other hand seem to be hiring as fast as they can because they've discovered all kinds of scalability issues when you go from 10 million users to 200 and their stock's way up, right? But first thing is, before we talk about product plans, are we in business, right? And then the second thing, really important, assuming you've got employees, are they okay? If we're working remotely, do they have tools? Are they psychologically all right? Are we getting food deliveries to the folks who don't have them? Are we making allowances and time for folks who've got small children at home or might be disabled or looking after parents, right? I think employees in this case are more important than products, at least in the short term, right? Do we have a business? Do we have our employees and are, are we thinking about them, right? Do they have the infrastructure to work remotely, right? Maybe we can drop ship, I don't know, you know, small printers and we can get them broadband or we can figure it out. We can get them green screens. Um, I think before we unpack our product plan, we got to make sure we got a company and then we have people working them. And then, and then, and then, and then we can look at our roadmap. We can look at our customers and see if the crisis is going to cause us to make different decisions. And it probably will. For instance, right? Let's think quickly before we act quickly. Your, that's your roadmap on the right, by the way. So whenever you make a change to the roadmap, you're likely to leave a bunch of pieces on the floor, right? So before we knee jerk decide that we're going to create a whole new initiative, Let's just stop for five minutes and think, right? And, and let's focus, I think, on smaller short-term shifts than bigger long-term shifts unless our whole business is in, the, is in the dumper here because it's easy to swap out something small. It's, it's dangerous when we add three new initiatives and don't take anything off the plate, right? So urgent but short-term, right? Validate, validate, validate. Call five customers and run the idea past them. Just because your executive on the sales side thinks it's a good idea doesn't mean it's a good idea. You know, many of us as product managers have a cluster of folks who we trust and we care about, right? Call a few of them up, find out if we're doing the right thing, right? And then it's really easy, the, the difference between and an exclusive or for anybody who's been a developer, right? Your executives will come in. Um, sorry, my dog's helping. Um, uh, your executives will come in and say, just do these 15 more things and don't take anything off the platter. And that just doesn't work. We're at capacity and people are in a crisis, right? We're going to get less done, not more. 
So be really thoughtful, be a little resistant, be strategic as we're getting lots of demands for change. Okay, so um, last thing is do some takeaways and then come back for some questions, right? So here's my four takeaways. I think as product folks, we're mission driven and we're customer value focused. It can't just be about the money, right? I think we must, 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 must get direct, unmediated access to our customers outside sales calls. If we're not doing that, I think we hang up our skis and go do something else, skates, do something else, right? Um, I like to hire for product experience because I know it takes two or three or five years to become a great product manager or more. And so if I have a lot of newbies on my team, I'm going to do all the work for them. So let's have a mix of how we're going to hire in so we're not just having everybody at the very beginning. And then in a crisis, you want to think urgently, but you want to think strategically. Slow it down just by a few hours to make sure we're not doing something really terrible to our customers. Okay, so um, uh, by the way, we have the, the recording of this, we have the PDF of this, anybody who wants the slides, just uh, let us know. Um, here's how to find me. Cleverly, I bought my domain name in 1992 when the Soviet Union wasn't buying Good domain job, names. Good job, Rich, good job. That's it, uh, that's how to find me, that's my 20 years of blog on there, it's all free in my book. Um, so do we wanna go through these last couple slides and then come back for questions? You know, we've got so many. In fact, Joy was just saying in the chat over there, there are so many good questions. Maybe we, maybe we need to have you come back for a QA. and a right? Which is fine. Let, give let's, people what they want. Let's do this. Let's flip to here and you can tell us about Nahito and then we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. I'll go long if folks want. So um, if we want to wrap up, then yes, let's absolutely give a plug for next week. We've got, uh, that will be Tuesday, June 23rd, 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Charles Topping is the founder of the Win-Loss Agency and principal fac facilitator at Market Driven Business. The topic will be Nahito Visits Like a Pro, which actually is uh, relevant to some of the questions we've got going on here too. But And, and you should tell us what Nahito stands for, by the way. Nahito, nothing important happens in the office. Our alumni will recognize that one is probably the, the funnest takeaway from that foundation's course. So you'll definitely want to hear how to do that like a pro, especially these days. Um, we've got a few people jumping off, but let's okay. just get to a few of the questions we've got here for you, Rich. Fire when um, ready. There was one that came in here from Donald that asked, is there a risk of having multiple different PMs or value teams calling on the same customers? Also, customers view it as a whole solution and may want to talk about multiple aspects. How can we reconcile those things? What Both really good questions. So yeah you, yeah, you want to be very careful about not pounding the same individuals at the same customer site with too many requests. Um, ideally, there's some kind of, you know, uh, scheme or list that we do this with. But I also notice, at least in the enterprise space where I live, that saying that you, you do business with Citibank doesn't mean you're going to call the same person at Citibank. Often the personas are different, the use cases are different, the people are different. Um, so we want to be careful not to abuse individuals. But if we've got enough customers out there, I usually find that there's enough users who are going to raise their hand and offer to do this too, by the way. So uh, an email or a post or something that says, we would like to get 45 minutes with users of this part of our application and we'll make a charitable donation on their behalf to any one of these five charities in return for their time is a great way to get lots of folks to raise their hands, right? Um, the other part is you absolutely want to avoid the situation where multiple product managers are banging on the same development team for contrasting or conflicting things, right? So I'm trying to glue the product managers to the teams, to the value stream. There's a lot of art in carving up those value streams and sometimes it doesn't work that well. But what's important is it's not just an inward looking navel gazing thing. There should be a group of users out there who actually use that stuff. And if there's enough of them, you can divide them up so you don't you know, overly burden the same people. I'm gonna get one more in here and then Rich, you had a, an email up there on the screen. Our folks sure. are welcome to submit. I'll just, I'll uh, just go there while we're talking, there. I'll just do that. That was uh, rich at miranoff.com, there we Cleverly. go. <laughs> And uh, here was one from Keith that uh, sounded interesting. I firmly agree getting the customer and the dev team together is absolutely necessary. Every time I've done that, I get better results. 
how do we convince execs and engineering to come on board with that idea, Rich? Yeah, I have less trouble convincing engineering because mm -hmm. I, I like to do it a little bit in the Skunk Works model. So if we call it an experiment, right? And we say, look, just for the next four weeks, I'm going to ask developers and designers to lean in on my calls. And then at the end of three or four weeks, what I find is that they've got pitchforks and torches and they're marching toward the executive suite saying we need to keep this, right? I, I never find that I can convince executives of anything except retrospectively. So how do we actually do this and then show it adds value and then demonstrate by having the people explain that it added value? Um, uh, permission last, I think, on that. Um, I have less trouble on the engineering side because everybody in engineering really wants to do this. They complain about the time, but I start by inviting the folks who are willing to make the time and then everybody else gets jealous. That's the um, Tom Sawyer paint the fence model. Beautiful. Well, um, we have to get back to our lives so that we can implement all of this good okay. advice into Bye our today. jobs. And I apologize that we didn't get to so many good questions out there, but you can see Rich's contact info up on the screen. Use that, what a great resource. Um, we already plugged the next topic, which is Nahito visits on June 23rd. If you can't wait that long, if you've got more questions, of course, you can join us every Friday at 1.30 p.m for office hours with a Pragmatic Institute instructor. That is another great resource. And of course, a big thank you to our partner today, Product Development Days. Don't forget to check out their event, October 27th through 29th, of which Pragmatic Institute is a platinum partner. You've got so many resources, everyone, make use of as many of them as you possibly can. It has been a pleasure, Rich, thank you so much. For it, chatting it, with it's us tremendously today. pleasurable for me. Thanks as well. And I'm going to be in that PDD event in October as well. So that's right. We'll see Beautiful. each other literally, but I look forward to seeing all of you again. I'll wave from the crowd. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you next time.